now I am joined by Bruce Cleveland of Wildcat Venture Partners. This is a real Silicon Valley VC with a tremendous background, tremendous uh, story. And I can't wait. I'm so excited to bring him uh, here to this audience. Bruce, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, you bet, John. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Now, I'm going to set this up a little bit. Well, actually, you know what? Why don't I let you set it up? Can you give us a little highlight about your background, your brushes with Steve Jobs, how you got into Wildcat Venture Partners, you know, writing the book? Because I think I know I've, you were so gracious to join us at America's Venture Capital Kickoff Conference, and you were absolutely a star, if not the star there, in my opinion. And thank you for that. So I know you can do an awesome job of this. Tell the audience, introduce them to what's up with you. Yeah, um, so – Briefly, I began my career on the operating side. I joined a really small startup located on Sand Hill Road, sort of the mecca of Silicon Valley. Um, that little startup, uh, maybe at, at that time, maybe 100 people, was Oracle Corporation. Um, that was back Amazing. in 1985. And I think we all, most people in the tech community know who Oracle is. Incredible, um, yeah. I mean, come on. So uh, that, that actually grew to have some modest success. I, I work for a guy named uh, Tom Siebel, and uh, Tom went on to build a company called Siebel Systems, and I, uh, I joined him in, af after I was running an engineering division at Apple. I joined another him legend. around, yeah, another, another fantastic um, contributor to the, to the technology community. And uh, we built that company from zero to two billion in revenue, uh, not valuation, um, revenue, in wow. about five, six years. Um, I, think he, I think at the time it may still be true that it um, was the fastest growing company in U.S. history. I think it was some insane rate, like 750,000 percent Kager. Oh, I believe that. Um, no, I believe that. Let me, yeah, let me, ask, was, let me ask you this because yeah. I'm, I'm super fascinated. Um, and, and how did you – now, you went to West Point. You have a fascinating – like how did you end up – in Silicon Valley, how did you get a job at Oracle? Because I know people, when they listen to these things, if I'm, you know, a student or if I'm just someone that's trying to do a startup, you hear about these legendary people. But it's like, how did you get your, how did you get your start? How did you get your break? How did you know that Oracle was the right place to join? I mean, I think that would be very interesting to talk about. <laughs> that's a that's a great question. So I actually left the academy early. Um, I was I was uh, top of my class in computer science. And I decided very early on uh, in, in my first year that I actually wanted to pursue that uh, versus a career in the military. Pursuing a career in the military is, is a perfectly great one, and many great classmates went on to have phenomenal careers um, in the military. But I decided that for me that I wanted to make a, a shift and uh, came back. I, I was born and raised in California, so I came back to California um, and focused in um, in in that particular area and was involved at AT and T um, helping them. I, my first job was actually at AT and T um, when they were going through the transformation from being a Bell operating company to actually being able to sell data, ah, um, got computer it. systems. Right. So yep. um, the consequence of that was um, I uh, I got involved in in developing stuff on Unix as an operating system. And, um, and one of the first projects at AT&T that, that I got involved in required out of the state of Washington to build an application that could run on a personal computer, a mini computer, and a mainframe, and did a bunch of market due diligence. Back then, it wasn't Google searching. It was you know, going to the library and <laughs> getting a bunch yes. of books. <laughs> and, yes. uh, and I ran into this little tiny you know, company called Oracle, called them up, got connected to this guy named Tom Siebel. Um, wow. They were off, I think, on some sort of, uh, you know, um, I think sales uh, conference, you know, for the top sales performers from the prior year. Got involved with Tom, got introduced to Larry Ellison, which is kind of an interesting story about having lunch downtown Menlo Park with him at a, a place that no longer exists called Sue Hong's. Um, in his beat up old crappy car <laughs> and, wow. uh, and decided this is, um, he's a very compelling, um, I think, uh, by the way, this is uh, sort of, we could talk a little bit later about market engineering, but, uh, yes. but Larry, Larry Ellison is a phenomenal, uh, storyteller, epic storyteller, um, which is one of the components of market engineering. And, uh, oh. and 
I just thought that he was wicked smart. He and Tom, and everybody I met there were, were really smart. And because of the projects that I've been involved in, I thought database is going to be fundamental to driving a lot of the, the transformation. Remember, in the old days, we ran on all different kinds of databases. They were file yep. system based, all this different stuff. Um, and Oracle had this idea about borrowing from IBM around this notion of relational databases, which would in, in, enable a lot of different types of applications to be built far more quickly, far more capably. So anyway, um, that's how I made that decision, um, based upon the people and based upon what I saw was a trend, uh, my own personal observation of the trend. That, by the way, so I'm, you know, let's just be upfront here. Although I think I've had a pretty, you know, a pretty good go in, in the Valley, it really all began, I think, with luck, with me getting involved exactly. with, with Larry Ellison and Tom yep. Siebel. So, you know, you, you sometimes you'd rather be lucky. In fact, I would say you'd rather be lucky than good. And that, that, um, that relationship formed that many years ago really gave me the opportunity to take advantage of other things, you know, th these other um, opportunities within the Valley. Uh, and we talked about that absolutely. And, you know, my, my Valley resume is nothing compared to yours. Um, but I mean, for my age, the time, everything like that, I'd like to think that I did some, some pretty great things for the level, but it was exactly the same thing. Like I just happened to go to the law school that Larry Sonsini and Mario Rosati went to, and they both taught there, you know, Larry, uh, Larry was teaching securities classes that I took at, at, at the law, at the Berkeley law school and Mario Rosati taught over there at the business school. And obviously Wilson Sonsini recruited heavily from there. And I had to, you know, chase them down and, and I got a job and, and because I worked for Mario and, and had my own skill set and my own hustle as you did too. I mean, it's, 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 it's where luck meets opportunity and, and preparation and, 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 and desire and will, right. Um, that I was right. able to really get all kinds of connections and learn with, from the, from the masters and some of the, some of the heavyweights and some of the names. But if I did not, if I wasn't lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time with the right people, it, none of it would have happened in my opinion, you know what I mean? Or it would have been so much harder. It would have been at a, at a, I, I definitely respect exactly, exactly what you are saying, but at the same time to give you absolute credit, you can have a lot of luck, but this isn't exactly, you know, the Valley isn't exactly lottery tickets. Most of the time. I mean, this is about having talent. This is about having uh, a knowledge. It's about working hard and talking about your book, it's about having a system and an approach. Traversing the traction gap is something that you just, you know, came up with here recently with some of the folks at Wildcat VC. I think you sent me an email, and, and I'll let you tell the story. You've had something to the effect of, of six-plus billion-dollar uh, valuations and some of the uh, investments that you've made. You're really an expert in the B2B uh, marketplace, especially with SaaS and, and, and software stuff. Tell me a little bit about the book. Tell me about your success. Tell me about your approach and why it's so critical right now. Yeah, well, so the book is a summation of my personal work experience in the Valley, plus a lot of other people. We did a lot of interviews uh, with people, uh, technologists and founders who had gone on to create very successful companies. And the reason, the impetus for me writing the dang thing was several fold. The first was is that um, when we sold Siebel to Oracle, I didn't go back to Oracle. This was in 2006. I wanted to do something different. I wanted to try um, venture, I, venture investing, and I, I'd never been part of the, the venture community. Oracle really wasn't a venture-backed company per se. It had a little bit, I believe, of venture money, but not much. Siebel didn't really have any either, so I wasn't really well connected there, but the um, I wanted to try something different. So um, the I joined a venture firm called Interwest Partners, and the, oh, here's yeah. the funny t trivia. Here's the trivia of the Valley. Where they're located is exactly where Oracle was located back in, in when I joined in, 19, um, uh, in 1985. So, I mean, literally, the same dang little building, the same trees, although they were probably twice as tall, and me was maybe potentially a lot more wrinkled. So, the um, – yes. The net, of, the net of that was that was kind of, um, I wanted to try something different, and um, and so I joined. You know, I I made some some fairly uh, good investments. Didn't know much about the venture industry, but I did know a fair amount about software and building software companies. So uh, one of the first was just in an idea, and I invested in in uh, three guys and a concept. I don't think there was any iconic dog involved, but I do believe that. Um, 
Well, I do believe that uh, it was just in, in the conference room, shared ideas around transformed marketing. And that company became Marketo. Um, wow. We, owned, we being Interwest, owned quite a significant uh, piece of Marketo um, at its IPO. And then last year, it was acquired by Adobe for nearly $5 billion. So um, pretty, re- pretty reasonable investment. Um, I invested some in Workday. Um, and a bunch of other um, companies, and we can talk about you know B two B versus B two C in a little bit. But um, a bunch of other companies that are really you know no name into consumers and the media, but very important companies in the business um, in the business markets. So that's what I um, what I did, um, and what I saw over the course of my ten years there, which is what really led to um, the book, was watching co- watching really smart people. Um, from really great schools with really great uh, product sense and, and um, engineering capabilities fail over yes. and over again. And looking at the data, you, you begin to, you, you look at, it's, it's pretty daunting. You know, I think everybody looks at startups as this glamorous area, but I mean, the truth of the matter is um, on average, if you just aggregate the entire group of what you call startups, there's around an 80, 85% failure rate. You, you specifically call out business to cons- I mean, consumer oriented, about 95% failure rates. CPG, consumer packaged goods, 98% failure rates. And by the way, it's not mm-hmm. limited to just startups, it's products. So products that come out from existing companies. So when you look at that and you look at ma- very smart people trained by really great universities, um, targeting, uh, you know, something, trying to change the world. And you, you, you start to begin to scratch your head over why are they failing? And I, I did a lot of analysis and came up with a framework that allowed you to, or allows one to, um, be able to more accurately uh, predict whether a company is going to succeed or fail um, at a time when there are very little, uh, um, there's very little market feedback, right? I mean, these are companies without much of a, much of a balance sheet, without many customers, if any customers. So yep. how do you apply MBA stats, you know, looking at uh, a GL, looking at income statements, balance sheets, et cetera? There's nothing to look at. You know, these are PowerPoint companies. They're not spreadsheet companies. So what, what do you do? And, uh, and so I, I began to dissect that and created a framework that lets entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, limited partners who invest in the venture capitalists um, begin to assess more quantitatively what these early stage startups need to do um, in order to get from an idea, to take their idea, uh, build a product, bring it to market, and then scale. So that's what this traction gap framework is. And the book, Traversing the Traction Gap, is basically a how-to prescriptive guide uh, for, for company startups to review and, and actually use uh, in order to help them get over this really huge hurdle called the traction gap, which is basically the go-to-market phase for a company. Yes. I, I think that's so so important, so impactful. And I actually read the uh, first chapter uh, last night. We'll talk about that on the other end of this break. We've got about a minute and a half here to, to, yeah, to, the, to the break. Um, you know, you and I were talking uh, a little bit the other day about exactly that. How you know, it's a lot of teams think that making the product is so important, and 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 once I ha- once I have this new widget, this super widget, it's going to do everything, and everyone's going to buy it. And it's there's very few times out there it happens, but there's very few times where where it's it's good enough to just have that product. And there's there's a real uh, lack of focus. On the communication, on the sales and marketing, I had one person, and I won't even, I won't name the name or anything. You know, looking at my resume because I did some time, uh, you know, in sales, and I want to get distracted because I really want to focus on you. And they're like looking at my uh, at, at my resume with with uh, you know car sales, and I was super good at at selling. And they're like, "What does this have to do with venture?" And I'm like, "Well, nothing and everything. <laughs> if you can't sell." You have nothing. And you remarked to me that, you know, Steve Jobs was not so much of a product engineer. He was a market engineer. But I'll, I'll but table that thought because we're going to well, I'm going I'm to hit us out here to a break. We're going to talk about all this and more with Bruce Cleveland. If you want to join the program, 786-633-5927, 786 
5927. You're listening to John D. Villarreal and Bruce Cleveland's joining me as my guest from Silicon Valley. You're listening to the John D. Villarreal radio show on 1210 AM Miami, the man, the only radio station where you are the man. Now, Bruce, uh, we talked about how you got into the venture game, your background at Oracle, Oracle, excuse me, Oracle Siebel Systems. I was thinking of both of them at the same time and try to put them together, and that didn't work out so well. Um, and the expertise in the B2B space. We also talked about the traction gap. I want to talk about that a little bit more, but I want to I want to talk about the traction gap here for a little bit more, and then I want to hit some lightning round um, topics because we have a lot of things we want to talk about. I want to talk about the state of VC investing, how competitive the U.S. is right now, exporting the Silicon Valley concept, et cetera. But let's talk a little bit more about this book. I read the first chapter, and you talk about slide 29, and I read this. I'm like, oh, my gosh. I, I totally – agree with this i know exactly what you mean and when what and i'll let you explain this but very quickly for the audience you see these powerpoint presentations you see these things from startups you see these uh, business presentations and they go through this these different there's different parts of the things that they do a really good job and and detail and okay the product and this and that whatever and then when it comes time to here's how we're going to go revenues or here's how we're going to gain market share it's this like hockey puck uh chart that just you know, comes out of nowhere. I think you talk about in the book, you know, creating a miracle, if you will. And there's very little explanation as to how this is going to happen or plan as to how this is going to happen. And isn't that the most important part of building a business? So talk about slide 29, talk about market engineering. It's, I think it's so valuable. In, and, and that's all in your book, The Traction Gap. Yeah. Hey, so here, the base, here's the basic concept. I mean, over and over again, I would get a uh, presentation from startup teams, 30 slides. The first 28 of them are typically, you know, here's the market, here's the product, here's how great it's going to be. And most of the teams that you talk to because they're technical can explain the architecture in detail, how they're going to code the thing, et cetera, et cetera. Slide 30 is the ask. We want to raise 500K. We want 5 billion, whatever, the, whatever it is, and we're going to use it for the following purposes. Slide 29 is basically my way of saying, hey, it's the financial slide where you see this great growth either in customer acquisition or revenue growth, et cetera. And it's, it kind of just sits there like a hangnail saying, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to build this business. And there is yet, there's nothing behind it. Yet when you take a look at the massive failure rates in the startup community, it's not really around product failure. I mean, I've built a bunch of products at Apple, I built, uh, at Oracle. Yep. Um, all of them, quote, worked. And I've invested in companies where the product worked. That is, it does what we said it would do. That does not mean that they, may, they are a commercial success. So we know that the biggest cost and, and, and the biggest impediment to success is really around go-to-market. I mean, what are you going to do to get people to change a process um, or change um, – to accept your product, but how much does it cost to acquire a customer? How, how big is the total market? Not just the total market as it currently exists, but in the way that you price your product. How are you going to get people to become aware of your product? How are they going to change the way that they, what they buy? Last time I checked, most businesses um, already spending money. Our budget's already pre-allocated. Not a lot of dollars hanging around for other stuff. How are you going to grab dollars from some other products or some other areas to get them to be spent on your area. None of that is explained. It's just kind of accepted as sort of a enthymomatic proposition <laughs> that yeah, somehow exactly. because of your wonderful stuff, the unstated premise is that they're going to buy it. That's ridiculous. It, it will not happen. And so um, what I decided to do in writing this book, was to codify all this into a concept, to, to codify the sort of go-to-market, the tactics, the strategies, et cetera, of selling and marketing into a term that I call market engineering. And when I saw companies, when I divided the winners from the loot, well, the not-so-winners, okay, um, in the startup mm -hmm. community, um, the difference really came down to not product engineering. It came down to the characteristics that under what I call market engineering. That would be things like, your category, category creation, uh, messaging, positioning, pricing, and storytelling, the ability to be an epic storyteller, Steve Jobs, Mark oh. Benioff at Salesforce. These are people who distort your reality field to Incredible. believe what they believe. 
and compel you to join their, their, you know, their ecosystem in the process. This is what creates market value. This is what creates the billion dollar quote unicorn companies because people want to be part of that. And where I find the biggest problem is that we have uh, a lot of teams that have great technologists who are not necessarily the best at these market engineering things, nor do they necessarily want to do them. So this Let me is ask why, uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Just real quick. This is amazing. I mean, I could talk to you for hours, but I just want to say a couple quick things and I want to get into the, the lightning round type of stuff. Why do you think that is? Do you feel like it's just that more technical people are drawn to Silicon Valley? Do you think that there's a lack of sales and marketing professionals? I know there's a lot of the PR firms that are out there, but you know, they're pretty expensive for startups. Like what, why are we missing that stuff on slide 29 with the marketing communication piece? I think it's because the management teams, the founders, CEOs, management teams think that's something to delegate to uh, to a Got PR it. group, et cetera. And I think that's a, a terrible mistake. The second thing I want to ask you is very quickly tell that story about because it's exactly this type of stuff. Um, when Steve Jobs was going to hire you over there at Next and, and why you, you turn that down because of the of the power that he has with the marketing side of it. Yeah, you know, one of these, you know, sort of trivia things is um, Steve was looking for a chief marketing officer when he was running and you know probably one of <laughs> I think he had already gone through four or five of them at the next uh, when that was like a computer system that maybe people remember um, so I, I was um, this is at a time when Apple was uh, was had been taken over by a guy named Gil Emilio. He had been on the board and yep. Apple was kind of floundering around. So yes. anyway, I get invited to meet with Steve. We, we meet at a restaurant in, uh, in Palo Alto. It doesn't exist any longer um, called late for the train, his favorite breakfast place. Cause he lived in Palo Alto. And uh, anyway, I meet with him. I met with him several times. And finally, you know, he really wanted, I, I guess I, I didn't fail to, uh, <laughs> I, I met up with some sort of measurements that he had and, and wanted me to really consider the job. <laughs> and I finally, I just looked and I said, Steve, look, you know, Next already has the, the world's best CMO. And he looked at me and I said, it's you. <laughs> you know, no, right. I can't, I'm, I'm not going to replace you. You're the, you're the, you are the quintessential chief marketing officer and you're going to be that. And you don't need a guy like me. You need somebody that can go execute your your plans but i don't want to just be an ex i don't want to just go execute stuff um so that's actually uh amazing. a month or so later i joined uh siebel systems with tom siebel oh that's amazing okay i want to hit like four different topics here we've got about five six minutes left so let's let's hit it quickly tell me a little bit about the state of VC investing now, like what's hot now? Let's talk about the sides of rounds. We've seen these mega, mega rounds from SoftBank with Uber and Lyft. And I don't think those were altogether successful. I think there's some issues there. And then also like with today's environment, do you feel like entrepreneurs need more money or do they need more expertise like the traction gap or accelerators, things like that? Well, uh, that's a really great question. So what we've seen over the last three or four years is um, a, a very big gap open up between uh, between sort of seed rounds, you know, these very early stage small rounds. Um, yes. Those seed rounds, which used to be 50K, 100, 200K, seed is now, you know, 2 million to 5 million, um, much bigger rounds. And, uh, and many, if not most of the venture firms, I would, I tend to feel that venture is sort of a, um, a very generous term. Um, it's not very venturous. It's more banker-like. Right. So until, until you demonstrate traction, until you have evidence that consumers are downloading and using your app or that in the business world that you have a certain amount of revenue, um, which is about 500K of what we call monthly recurring revenue, um, until you have about that, kind of, that, that sort of number, most of the brand name venture firms are not going to invest in you. Um, and so what happened, what's happened is that there's this huge, you know, desert that you have to cross from the time that you first create your product to generating traction before most of the venture community will invest in you. What's happened though is that once you demonstrate traction, those, those, those venture firms, because they're looking 
they've raised a lot more money, have a lot more money to put to work, and not necessarily lots of additional general partners to make those investments. They have Jason, to put larger, yeah, they have to put larger sums to work. So what we've seen um, from seri- what we would all call Series A and B investments, those I think um, 82% of all Series A and B are uh, rounds now, which used to be super early stage rounds are now at 10 million or more per round and, and 60 some odd percent um, are 25 million or more. These Amazing. are, this is not venture capital. This is yeah, banking different. performed for early stage investing. And it's, it's being driven. And I would do it by the way, as well. If I were the brand name firms, um, the Accenture's Sequoia's, I mean the um, Excel's, Sequoias, Andreessen, the benchmarks, those firms, I would want to, um, you know, I would use my brand and I would basically, I would suck out the oxygen of the, of the capital um, markets, raise other, yep. ra- other funds, right. And put, and put money yep. to work, just yep. other people out. It makes, it makes, I, good I got I got to have you on again and talk about all, all this. There's so much I can talk to you about very quickly. We literally have two minutes here. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to blend these questions, two questions together here. And then we'll do one last one. How competitive do you think the U.S. is right now with technology and venture? We talk. We, we're, there's a lot of conversation about that. And how available do you think it is to export the Silicon Valley model? Like Miami is starting to really grow in the startup scene. Do you think that can be done? So uh, the, uh, the simple question is: I, th- I think the U.S. is still um, the leader in in technology development and um, and delivery. And the reason is is that I think we just have our culture is much more um, uh, independent, entrepreneurial. Uh, it's hard, and it's hard to transform cultures of, company, of countries, right? The DNA that's set as your culture in a country, really hard to overcome that. So that's the first piece. The second part to the, second part to the question is, okay, what about Miami? Well, I would classify Miami as a regional technology center. I mean, there are other areas throughout the U.S. that are becoming it as well. And there's, there's several ingredients that are necessary. One, you need a strong university system to develop the talent. Number two, you, you need people who are located in the area who are uh, and have been successful entrepreneurs. And initially, I think it begins with an angel, uh, you know, an angel community that's willing to back some of these younger folks. Um, the, the issue really around for, for professional investors um, before they come in, they're going to really want to see, again, they're going to want to see some traction behind some of these, these groups. So awesome. if, if Miami, Denver, you know, um, uh, Austin, in Idaho, right, Austin, yeah. yep. they need, those are the raw ingredients that are necessary in order, and with people with connections back into the, the larger uh, capital areas. So that's, without that, it's pretty tough. It's a pretty tough go. Sorry, my little daughter here was running around in the background. She wants to see dad. I mean, I, th- this is a fantastic. I want to have you on again. I want to talk about, you know, there's so many things to talk Bruce, you are phenomenal, fantastic. Thank you for joining us. The book is called Traversing the Traction Gap. Bruce Cleveland of Wildcat Venture Partners. You've been listening to the John D. Valerio Radio Show on 1210 AM, Miami, the man, the only station where you are the man. Have a great weekend, everybody.